Hi there. I'm Reverend Jim Burklow, Senior Associate Dean of Religious and Spiritual Life at the University of Southern California. And I welcome you to our third session in our series on Christian Contemplative Practices. Annually, for several years, I visited the monastery of the Benedictine Sisters of Perpetual Adoration. They lived in a beautiful compound north of downtown Tucson. And I was amazed by the physical, mental, and spiritual liveliness of these mostly older women and their level of engagement with the world despite their semi-cloistered way of life. Their central spiritual practice is to stare at the closed doors of a small box containing the wafer and the Eucharist. An unusual job, is it not, to perpetually adore a piece of bread. I joined them for their Vesper service, which begins and ends with this practice. We stare at the tabernacle, which is a box containing the wafer at the far end of their big ornate chapel. I contemplated the box itself, the idea of adoring the wafer, the wafer itself, and the mysterious idea that the Christ and all of us and everything else are at one with that wafer. I kept my gaze fixed on it, and when Vespers was over, I released that focus attention and noticed its echo. Focusing attention and then releasing it made me suddenly more aware and awake to everything and everybody in the chapel. And it seems to me that the sisters practicing perpetual adoration of the Blessed Sacrament are savoring their hunger for the wafer in the box on the altar. They are delaying gratification and paradoxically experiencing gratification in the process. They are becoming more fully human in this practice. The central rite of Catholic, Orthodox, Lutheran, and Episcopalian worship is the Mass, which centers itself on the sharing of bread and wine, remembering the last meal of Jesus with his disciples before his crucifixion. Many other branches of Christianity follow the same ritual, which they call communion or the Lord's Supper. In the Bible story, Jesus told his disciples that the bread was his body and the wine was his blood. I offer it to you now as the focus of your contemplation. Join me virtually by getting a cracker or a piece of bread and setting it in front of you so that you can gaze at it. Gaze at it in a visio divina for several minutes of meditatio. Then close your eyes and go into contemplatio. What echo or aftertaste emerges? Pause this video now, using this image for your focus, if you will, and then return after 10 minutes. Take the bread or the cracker and raise it before you and join me. This is the body of Christ. Take and eat. And close your eyes and attend to the experience of consuming the bread as you eat it. Pay attention to its taste, to its texture to the way that it changes as you consume it. Pay attention to the way that the body of Christ becomes your body. All who practice contemplative Christianity are Aramites. Eremia is the biblical Greek word for desert or uninhabited place. The places that Aramites inhabit. The old English word for the Latin eremia is hermit. In prayer, we find hermitage, whether in the outer or inner desert, a clean, quiet, uncluttered space where we can observe our experience clearly. Now, faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. This passage from Hebrews in the New Testament is another illustration of the via negativa, Faith is what's left when the visible, the definable, the comprehensible, 
are dropped on the way up the desert mountain to meet God face to face. In contemplative practice, we observe each of these things, and without judgment or regret, we let them go one at a time. As did Jesus, we come to the desert at least as much for what is not there as for what is. Monastics of every religion are drawn to it. Moses encountered God in a bush on a desert mountain. The first theologians of Christianity were known as the Desert Fathers. In wilderness they prayed, meditated, contemplated, uncluttering their hearts and minds in an uncluttered space. Muhammad went to a desert cave, and there he waited until the angel Gabriel dictated the Quran to him. Around the same time, Buddhist monks retreated to the mountainous deserts of Central Asia to meditate. The 20th century Trappist Catholic monk Thomas Merton wrote, the Desert Fathers believed that the wilderness had been created as supremely valuable in the eyes of God, precisely because it had no value to men. The desert was created simply to be itself, not to be transformed by men into something else. So too the mountain and the sea, the desert Therefore is the logical dwelling place for the man who seeks to be nothing but himself. In the Christian classic of spirituality, The Cloud of Unknowing, whose author purposely kept his or her name unknown out of humility, we get a taste of Christian mysticism as it manifested for much of the history of the faith. 200 years later, St. John of the Cross used very many of the same phrases and illustrations found in the cloud in his works. There are two clouds, the cloud of forgetting and the cloud of unknowing. In meditative prayer, the seeker uses the apophatic method, the via negativa, to let go of all that gets in the way of the experience of God. All that is not God, all that obscures God, drops down into the cloud of forgetting. And then one aims upward. As the text says, let your longing relentlessly beat upon the cloud of unknowing that lies between you and your God. Pierce that cloud with the keen shaft of your love. One of the Aramitic monks, the Desert Fathers of Early Christianity said, what condemns us is not that our thoughts enter into us, but that we use them badly. Indeed, through our thoughts, we can be shipwrecked, and through our thoughts, we can be crowned. Christian prayer casts a net into the sea of our thoughts, catching them in a fine, strong net, pulling them into the shore of our consciousness for closer examination. After casting and pulling over and over, we awaken to the reality that it is God for whom we are fishing. The mystics knew that deep, searingly honest self-examination leads to encounter and union with God. St. John of the Cross, in his Dark Night of the Soul, wrote that from this arid night, there first of all comes self-knowledge, whence, as from a foundation, rises this other knowledge of God, for which cause St. Augustine said to God, let me know myself, Lord, and I shall know thee. The cloud of unknowing says, simply sit, relaxed and quiet. Be careful in this work and never strain your mind or imagination, for truly you will not succeed in this way. Leave these faculties at peace. No sooner has a person turned toward God in love than through human frailty he finds himself distracted by the remembrance of some created thing or some daily care, but no matter, no harm done, for such a person quickly returns to deep recollection. B. Griffiths was a 20th century Catholic monk who lived for decades in an Indian ashram, practicing monastic Christianity in an Indian Hindu context. And he wrote, behind all knowledge is the knower, 
which can never appear, never be seen, never become an object. It is the subject, not the object of thought. The I that thinks, not the I that is thought. It is the ground of consciousness, just, it is, just as it is the ground of existence. This is the experience of the capital S self, the Atman, beyond being insofar as there is an object of thought, beyond thought insofar as thought is a reflection or a concept of being. It is pure awareness of being, pure delight in being. Jesus fanned this divine flame with his followers so they could see what was real inside and out. Seek and do not stop seeking until you find. When do you find, you will be troubled. When you are troubled, you will marvel and you will rule over all. The kingdom is inside you and it is outside you. When you know yourselves, then you will be known and you will understand that you are children of the living Father. But if you do not know yourselves, then you dwell in poverty, and you are poverty. These are words of Jesus found in the very early Christian text, the Gospel of Thomas. Consistently in the ancient documents that describe his life and his teachings, Jesus is portrayed as urging his followers to examine themselves. He said, your heavenly father knows what you need before you ask him. Jesus taught that your prayer and God's hearing of your prayer are one and the same. In uh, one of the Odes of Solomon, which was an important hymn book used in early Christian churches, this phrase is found. Look, the Lord is our mirror. Open your eyes and see your eyes in him. So here, in closing for our series on Christian contemplative practices, I'm going to offer 12 practices that can serve as warm-ups for contemplative prayer, steps on Guigo's ladder toward contemplatio, union with the divine. Number one, mindfully observe your thoughts and feelings and urges. Close your eyes, stay quiet for at least 20 minutes, and observe what is going on in your mind and your body. What claims your attention? What emotions and bodily sensations do you feel? What ideas and plans and memories bubble up? Simply be present for your experiences, like a trusted, caring friend, without trying to judge or change what you observe. God is the one within you who observes it all with loving attentiveness and acceptance. Number two, look at an everyday, unremarkable thing, anything at all, for several minutes until you notice something beautiful or impressive about it that you never saw before. That out-of-ego moment of wonder is an experience of God. Number three, Look at another everyday unremarkable thing for several minutes, very closely and, in, and very intently, and then release your attention to it and notice what you experience. That moment of expanded awareness is an experience of the fullness and the vastness of the agape love that is God. Number four, seek out someone with whom you have a difficult relationship and listen to them for at least half an hour. As you listen, observe, and then release any attachment you have to your opinions about this person. You're not trying to fix things with this person. You're not trying to be this person's best friend. You're just there to pay close attention to them. And that attention is the love that is God. Number five. Choose one public policy issue that has an important direct or indirect effect on vulnerable people, on the young, the elderly, prisoners, the sick, immigrants, people of low incomes. You probably don't have time to go deeply into every issue, so just pick one. 
Seek information about that policy issue from the most reputable, objective, in-depth sources you can find. Stay on top of current debates or events that relate to this issue. Inform your friends and family about it when the right occasions arise. Communicate with your elected officials and other policymakers about your views on this issue on a regular basis. Show up at events that may have a strategic event effect on making things better for people affected by this policy. The deep concern that you feel for these people expressed through your attentive learning and activism is God. Immerse yourself in nature for number six. Take a walk in the wilderness or at least in your neighborhood. One word per stride. Ask yourself, what is here? What is here. Over and over until you begin to feel present in the moment, noticing and attending to all that is around and within you, instant by instant, item by item. The moment you can say, I am here, I am here as you walk, you have arrived at the I who is God. Number seven, watch a small child play. Observe the child trying to do something that he or she cannot yet accomplish. Observe your urge to help the child do the task, and then let go of that urge. Let the child know that you're there, paying attention, but don't intervene in the play until and if you sense a clear invitation from the child to do so. Open yourself to imagining what the child is thinking and sensing and begin to play with the child in the way that the child is playing. The moment you give up your adult perspective and take on the child's perspective in, in playing, you are playing with God. Number eight, draw a picture. Then look at the picture. Observe what's there, but also observe your reactions to the picture. Do you judge it somehow? Do you have opinions about it? Do you wish it were different? Notice these experiences as you look at the picture. Then draw another picture slowly and do the same thing as you were drawing it, noticing your feelings and opinions about it as you go. Look at the finished picture and again observe your reactions to it. Do it again and again until you feel liberated from your own opinions about your own drawings and simply enjoy the process of drawing and looking at what you have drawn. When that happens, you have drawn a picture of God. Number nine, go to a house of worship of any faith and sit and listen to the liturgy or prayers. Instead of focusing on the words being said or sung or on their meanings, focus intently on the silences between the words and the sounds. Notice and savor as many moments of quiet, some very short, some others longer, as you can. Let the silences become the source of meaning for the sounds in the worship service. When you are enthralled by the sound of sheer silence, you are hearing God. Number 10, take a walk in a familiar environment, one you see every day. Look at everything around you and name it. Tree, house, car, dog. Then start to do it another way. My idea of tree. My idea of house, my idea of car, my idea of dog. Then in the same way, start naming your emotions and feelings and thoughts alongside naming the things in your environment. My opinion of dislike for that car, my feeling of pain in my foot, my thought of trimming that tree. Do this until you're awakened to the fact that so much of your inner and outer experience is based on your ideas of things rather than the things themselves and their real essence. When you're awake to the possibility that the world around you has an essence that's beyond your ideas and opinions, you have awakened to God. Number 11, keep a journal recording your nighttime dreams. You don't need to describe the dreams in great detail, just make notes of their important features. Pay attention to the themes and images that repeat in your dreams. Let go of any fixed interpretations for the elements of your dreams. Just let your dreams be as they are 
and in reflecting on them, see what arises. Use them as texts for Lectio Divina. Let them sink into you in Lectio and Meditatio and see what bubbles up from them in Oratio and Contemplatio. Finally, number 12, look at yourself in a mirror. First, observe your face and head as a whole. What emotions and thoughts and opinions arise as you gaze in the mirror? Then after several minutes, focus on the pupils of your eyes for several more minutes. Stare into the darkness of your pupils. What do you see? What thoughts, experiences, and emotions arise as your eyes gaze into your eyes? Who is doing the seeing? We're near the end of this video, so when it ends, get a mirror and do this practice for 10 minutes. The words of St. Paul, love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these is love. In the words of St. Teresa of Avila, the glory of St. Augustine says that neither in the streets of the city, nor in pleasures, nor in any place wherever he sought him, did he find him as he found him within himself. This is clearly the best way. We need not go up to heaven nor any further than our own selves. In the first century, mirrors were dim. Many were made of polished brass, which was nowhere nearly as reflective as the silver glass we use today. You could look in a brass mirror and get a rough idea of how you looked, but it was hardly a face-to-face -face encounter. St. Paul's oft-quoted love passage in the first letter to Corinthians includes the alluring promise that one day, instead of looking in the mirror and seeing a dim image of ourselves, we'll look directly at God in a perfect, clear mirror. Paul does not say so, but we might speculate that he meant that if the mirrors of our souls were polished brightly enough, they would reflect God's image in our own. Maybe Paul was describing the same kind of experience that Teresa of Avila envisioned, in which she looked in a mirror and saw Christ suffused completely into herself. This was the message of so many of the mystics of Christian history, that to know oneself ultimately and completely was to know God. Some of them, including Jesus, ran afoul of the religious hierarchy for saying so. It sounded dangerously like heresy to suggest that you could experience God directly within yourself without the intervention of religious authorities. But it was at the heart of the message of Jesus, who taught that the kingdom of heaven is within and among us. It was the message of St. Paul as well. Mira que te mira, mira que te mira, mira que te mira, mira le. Mira que te mira, mira que te mira, mira que te mira. Mirale. Christianity is the practice of polishing our mirrors and gazing intently into them, not to admire ourselves with egotistic pride or scornful judgment but to see clearly what is going on inside of us, awaken to the divine inner observer observing us, and then turn our compassionate gaze toward other people. In contemplative prayer, I start polishing 
the mirror with loving, open, non-judgmental attention. My inner eyes begin to adjust and focus. And I begin to see not just the face I expect or want to see, but the whole picture of my thoughts, sensations, and urges, physically and mentally and spiritually. Behind the eyes that appear in the mirror, I become aware of the one who is doing the watching. And then we begin to see 